I want to open in prayer, and then we're going to get into this tonight um, and ask the Lord for his help. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, these, these times that we get into a teaching, into the word. We pray, God, that you would help us grow in this. Our desire, Lord, is this gathering would not just begin here and end here, but God, it would take us to a next level in you. And I just pray, God, by your spirit, you would grace us with your presence, Lord. Thank you for being faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to just tell you that when you start, uh, if you haven't got those already, you're going to get a book. I almost say it's going to be a workbook for you. And it's basically a Bible study that you're going to go through uh, for on your own for the next six or seven weeks. And so this is for your devotional time. This is for your growth. This is to help you grow. This is to help you be increasing in, in knowledge and Increasing in the goodness of God, but learning more about the Gospel of Luke. I heard someone say recently that that uh, if you want to know about the great Jesus being the Son of God and the deity of Christ and the wonder of the glory of His uh, really being the Son of God, you would go to the Gospel of John. Gospel of Luke shows us how Jesus lived and shows us how He cares for those that are in need and cares for those that are hurting. And so just ignore this part here. I will refer to this in a minute, but I want you to refer to where, where we are. Let me start off the, today by telling you, number one, when you read the Gospel of Luke, who is Luke? I want to talk to you for a minute about who is, who's Luke? Um, Luke is a companion of the Apostle Paul. If you uh, have never heard that before, I want you to know that Luke was one who traveled with the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. He's a, a physician. And the Bible refers to him in Acts chapter 16. If you look, at, look it up later, Acts chapter 16, you will find that Luke was a gentleman who went with Paul on his missionary journeys. There is something that happens if you're reading the Gospels and if you read Acts, you will find that in chapter 16, he begins to talk about the we. He says instead of Paul did this, he says we did this. So that's an indication that Luke was the writer of this. This was written around uh, 63, they say 63 to 68 AD. And uh, make sure you realize uh, also, if you don't know this already, Luke and Acts were written by the same person. They were written by Luke. And so you can really, you probably could really say it like this, the Luke, Luke part one and Luke part two, or Acts being the second part of Luke's writings. You could say Luke one, Luke two. But Luke and the book of Acts, written by Luke. Luke was a man who was a physician. Actually, Paul refers to him in Colossians. He said, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, and, and as does Demas. And so Colossians makes it clear that Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. He helped Paul. He went with Paul. And also, he was someone who was educated. And so when you read the Gospel of Luke, and when you read the, God, the, the book of Acts, they are written by someone who is very educated in their writing. So just please keep that in mind as you go through this. So understand that Luke's a doctor. He is it was written about 63 to 60 A.D. And again, Luke and Acts were written by the same person, Luke the physician. Now it's written to someone named Theophilus. Beloved, excellent Theophilus. Well, who is this man? Who is Theophilus? And really what it means, loved by God. And here's the idea of God being, being a friend of God. Who is Theophilus? And so we want you to take a minute and realize that when you're reading the Gospel of Luke and when you're reading Acts, it is written to a man or a group of people. I'll explain it in a moment. And it's written in order to explain the stories, the life, the ministry of Jesus. So understand that Theophilus was someone who was interested in hearing more about Jesus and wanting the stories of Jesus compiled. It together. If you read in this uh, scripture, it will say, Luke says that I, others have written things about Jesus. Now I'm putting together another um, gospel of Jesus to give you a complete idea of who Jesus is. Let me go back to a moment when it comes to the, Luke being a doctor. Being a physician, and I'll talk about it in a minute, he cared deeply about people. He cared deeply about people's needs. You, you have read in the scriptures before that Jesus sweat in the garden drops of blood. One gospel writer refers to that medical incident. It's the physician, Luke. Understand, he cares about people, and I'll talk about that, and he talks about people Jesus cares for. 
So Theophilus is this man who's loved of God, he's a friend of God, and the, the Bible it talks about him, and some people want to know who he is. Some people believe it's a generic title to all Christians. In other words, you're loved of God, and so I'm sending out to all the beloved, all those who are loved of God, I'm sending this to you because you're beloved of God, and so it could apply to all Christians. Other people believe that it was a Roman lawyer that he was sending to Paul's defense attorney when Paul was in prison and Paul's going up for trial, that he sends this story of, of all the things Jesus did, all the, the works that Jesus was about, and things that happened in the book of Acts. And also, some believe was a high priest. He was a high priest. There was a, in history a man named Theophilus who was a high priest, who uh, many believe he was interested in uh, the Lord, and Theophilus may have been a man that Paul was writing in order to win him to Jesus. Others believe he was an influential leader. He was an influential leader that Paul was, com excuse me, uh, Luke was commissioned to write this to. I believe all of them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I believe it is written to an influential man, and it is written to him, whether he be a lawyer or not, is an influential man who needed and wanted to know more about this wonderful Savior called Jesus. So understand that when you read the Gospel of Luke, Theophilus, now realize that when you read this, it is written to all believers, but it is written specifically to Theophilus, but it applies to everyone. It applies to all New Testament believers. So when you read in the Gospel of Luke, you will find some things that are powerful for you in your spiritual growth. Now, I want to tell you from the outset of this, as we're recording it and as we're together, this, this class is going to be probably more a and I won't hate to call it a class, a study is going to be probably more along the lines of a little deeper than what you're used to. This will probably be a, you'll learn out of this. When you leave here, you'll probably get uh, some, some really uh, teaching that you haven't gotten anywhere else before. or Maybe you have gotten before. Maybe it's a refresher. But understand, this is going to be a time where you're going to do a lot of work yourself. And you're going to hear some things when I talk. Because my plan is for you to do study on your own through the Word going through the Word, because it goes through every chapter, you will go through the Gospel of Luke yourself in personal study during this season on your own, but also here I will talk about some highlighted scriptures and incidents we'll find in the Bible. So let me tell you what uh, you, you'll see in the Gospel of Luke. Here's things that are emphasized in the Gospel of Luke. You ready? Number one is this, that Jesus is the Messiah. We use this term when we talk about Jesus being the Messiah. It's Christ. Messiah was the one they were looking for who would be the in the throne of David, who would be the one who would set up the kingdom. And the Bible was really clear what the Messiah would be and what he would do. And so I want you to know when you see Jesus as the Messiah, you see that Jesus is one in whom is the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies is found in Jesus. Luke emphasizes this. And if you really want to think about this, one of the, the greatest stories that you'll ever learn, when we do this all the time, we, we do the Christmas uh, pageants and Christmas stories, and the one that's used the most is the Christmas story found in the Gospel of Luke. We, we talk about the wise men, we talk about Emmanuel, God with us from Matthew, but the one in the Gospel of Luke is the story that most people learn. It's the story that was in the Charlie Brown Christmas special years ago, and what did the angels say to, to, the, to Mary? You will give birth to the Messiah. You will give birth to the Christ. What does the angel say to the shepherds? There is one who is born to you, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, the Lord, and they begin to sing, glory to God in the highest. So the emphasis, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. You, you'll see this emphasis in the Gospel of Luke over and over again. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is not just another man. He's not just a prophet. He is God's Son, God, deity in the flesh, who walks about this earth to show us how to live and show us what to do. By the way, let me just put it this way. Uh, per pure, pure doctrine, Jesus Christ is pure doctrine. If you want to know what God is like and what he's about, it, you find it in Jesus. Let me just say this to you. I haven't said it in any other uh, venue, but I'll say it in this venue. If you really have a desire to know how God feels about you, I would encourage you to read the Gospels. Don't start in the book of Leviticus, all right? Go to the Gospels, and in the Gospel of Luke, you will find the pure doctrine of who God is in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. You also find that he's God's servant. 
that he, he does, he obeys the Father. You'll find in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is one who obeys the Father, that he cares about those who are marginalized and forgotten. It's the Gospel of Luke that you'll hear a lot about lepers and widows, and you'll hear it others too, but really emphasize. Uh, you'll hear about those that are downcast. You'll hear about those, you can't read my writing, that's okay. You'll read about those who are, um, who are the world would call sinners. Jesus was with the sinners. You, you'll read about that in the Gospel of Luke. And so the Gospel of Luke, is a, the emphasis is the compassionate love of God. Uh, it, the Gospel of Luke would connect with the rooms of grace, right? It would connect with that because the Gospel of Luke is about God's desire to help the marginalized, to help those that are broken and forgotten. The Gospel of Luke, you'll hear that. You know, we, we did uh, Night to Shine every year here, although this year, Unfortunately, Night to Shine in February is virtual. They're not doing a live Night to Shine anymore. We did a special needs prom. They're not doing it this year. Nationwide, it's going to be virtual. They're doing it at the different facilities people are staying in. But that is one of the things that blesses me because I love that, that moment. And we'll do, you know, na nationwide, that's what they came out with. Tim Tebow Foundation came out with that uh, six months ago or so. But can I tell you, one of the things I like about that is that, that we are having a party for others, right? We're having a party for others, not to get doing anything for ourselves. It's for, it's for other people. Luke's, Luke's the one that quotes Jesus and says, when you have a party, don't invite your friends because they have to pay you back. Invite the ones who cannot pay you back. Luke's the one who says that because he is about the forgotten. He emphasizes, shares with us about the forgotten. And he's the anointed. Oh, I get to go back to where I was. He is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to emphasize that tonight. Jesus is anointed, filled, empowered, flowing in the Holy Spirit of God. And so when you read the Gospel of Luke, it will emphasize that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He is here to do the Father's business. He cares about those that are in need. And he is anointed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus shows us what the church really should be like, right? Amen. Now, there's some key verses I, I want to cover tonight, and really, as an introduction, you only get a little bit of, of what I want to say in these next few weeks. I'm going to do a little bit tonight. But the key verses in this uh, gospel study is this. One is this, that the, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. In other, and he says that when he's dealing with Zacchaeus. I don't know if you know the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a, was a little uh, in stature, and he was a man who was, who was a tax collector. He was a man who was absolutely one who was probably, uh, if you, you and I would talk about our modern day, he was thought of as a thief, as a betrayer, as a dishonest person. Nobody liked the tax collector. Nobody liked Zacchaeus. He was a sinner. I mean, he was rotten. And scripture says Jesus goes through the city of Jericho, and they prepared a place the religious leaders and the dignitaries prepared a place for him to eat. And he goes through the city. I'll tell you how I know this in a minute. He goes through the city. He's leaving, and he sees Zacchaeus in a sycamore tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm, I'm going to go to your house today. And they read the Bible. The Bible says they were furious at that. Because here's what happened. Jesus was already out of the city. Sycamore trees in Jewish culture, big sycamore trees, were you couldn't they were considered unclean and could not grow inside the city limits. So that Zacchaeus was already outside the city. Jesus was already passing his way through and turns around to eat with Zacchaeus. And you know what the Bible says? Zacchaeus is overwhelmed with this. They're, they're mad. See, Jesus, Jesus is the uh, I, I put it the other day. He he's the he's the black and white guy. Jesus is the guy who you he's a divider. He will either he will either uh, crush you, or he, and, and you will fall on at his knees, or he will oh, offend you greatly, right? Jesus will. That's why the world don't want you to talk about Jesus. They don't want you to talk about everything else. Talk about everything else but Jesus. Because what happens is, you know, the story where Jesus is at the, at, at the house of the Pharisees, and the woman comes in and washes his feet, right? At one moment, you saw two hearts revealed. The woman whose heart was full of worship, and the Pharisee whose heart was full of religion. At, at one moment, Jesus just reveals hearts. Jesus has a way to reveal our heart. And in that moment, Jesus revealed two hearts. He revealed the heart of the religious people who were angry at him. Why are you going to Zacchaeus' house? We've, we've come, come, to, 
come to the dignified people's house. And in the same moment, he sees Zacchaeus and he reveals a heart of repentance. And they look at Jesus and said, we cannot believe that you're going to this house. And Jesus says this, that the Son of Man, referring to him, number one, by the way, that is the number one re reference. Jesus calls himself Son of Man more than anything else in the Bible. He calls himself Son of Man. Because there's two references. That number one, he wants you to know he's fully man. Okay? Fully man. I'll write this down. Fully man. And number two, he wants you, and put it here, Daniel prophesies that the Son of Man will come and ascend and sit on the throne and rule the nations. And Jesus said, the prophecy of Daniel is fulfilled in me. I'll, I'll refer to that down the road in our teaching, Lord willing. And he says, for me, he refers himself to the Son of Man. The Son of Man came, came to do what? To seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Key verse in the book of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, key verse is that Jesus said, I am here for a purpose. I am here to seek and save the lost. I think that is so powerful even when it comes to church ministry, even when it comes to our own personal life, even when it comes to our own neighborhood we live in, that God has called us specifically where we are and our God's desire through us is to work through us to see the lost saved, to see those that are wayward come back to him. That's the, a key verse in the scripture. And so I want you to see, when you look at the Gospel of Luke, this is one of them. There, there's a second section of verses I think are key to the Gospel of Luke. And it's found actually in one of my favorite scriptures in Luke chapter 4. Jesus is going into the, the, the synagogue, okay? He's just been anointed by the, the Spirit of God. Jesus is now coming out of the wilderness, right? He's been in the wilderness, tempted of the enemy. He's coming out of that. He goes to his own hometown, right? He shows up. He goes to the synagogue, and they hand him a scroll. And he opens the scroll, and he reads what it says. And here's what it says. It says that the Spirit of the Lord, he reads this. It's from Isaiah 61. I'll write this down here, Isaiah 61. He says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the what? To the poor. To the poor. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Poor in that context are those who are waiting on God. Poor has not only those that are, don't have anything, but those that spiritually don't have anything. Those who are waiting on the Lord to help deliver them from their circumstance. Jesus says that he is reading from Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61, he says, the Spirit of the Lord, God's Spirit is upon me. He has anointed me. I'm anointed and empowered and strengthened to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Heal those whose hearts are broken. He has sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. To recover sight to the blind. Set at liberty them that are bruised. He is laying out the outline of his whole ministry right here. You ready? Now I'm, I'm going to change my colors here just for a second so I can emphasize this one more time. You ready? Watch this. Here's what he's doing. Here's what he's doing. He, he's saying that the Lord has called him to do several things. He said, number one, to preach. Number one, Preach the gospel to the poor. Number two, heal the brokenhearted. Number three, deliver the captives. Number four, recover sight to the blind. Number five, set liberty them that are bruised. He said, that is the purpose why I've come. And by the way, this outline of Jesus' ministry, there's one more aspect I'm going to share in a minute. This outline of Jesus' ministry has to be at the core of, the, of our outline of our church. And it has to be at the core of the outline of your spiritual life. It has to be. There is, at the end of the day, as we're watching and recording this now and in this room, at the end of the day, you cannot separate what God wants to do in his church from what God wants to do in you. They are the same. I heard people in the past say, well, I think the church should do this and the church should do that. And then you, you, know, you can also look at them and say, well, you are the church. Go do it. The church... What God wants to do in you, he can do in us together. So it's all of us. But notice this. Jesus said that when the Messiah comes, they knew, listen, they knew that when the Messiah comes, this is talking about the Messiah. 
all, all of these people in his hometown, right? All of these folks in his hometown, when they ever they read this scripture, they knew it referred to the Messiah, the Son of God. He was going to show up. And when Jesus is reading this, he's reading this in a way that's going to blow their minds. Because he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach. He sent me to heal broken hearts, to deliver captives, recover those that are blind, set liberty to those that are bruised. And he says one more thing, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now understand, the next verse, uh, it says, they all looked at him and he says, I think in Luke 20 or 21, he says, this is fulfilled in your hearing fulfilled right now he's saying i am the one this is fulfilled in your hearing think about it for a minute he is he is telling them straight out that the scripture he just read the scripture he just shared with them is fulfilled in him now think about it i know it's easy for us looking back now going well you know that's that's easy for us to accept because we accept jesus as lord and we believe he's savior but understand it's his hometown later on jesus says a prophet's honored everywhere except his own hometown. And think about this. They've seen him work in the carpenter shop with his dad. They, they, we saw him play with their kids when they were little. They've seen Jesus do all kind of things. Now who is he to say all of a sudden that he is the fulfillment of the David's kingdom, messianic savior of the world and savior of the Jewish people? And when he says this, the scripture says they want to throw him off the edge of the cliff. Look at it later, end of chapter 4. They, they want to throw him off the edge of the cliff. They're so offended at what he had to say. They, they didn't understand what he had to say. But I want you to look at this one part of the scripture. He said, he sent me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What does that mean? Let me just put it in a way. It's called the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. And what is the year of Jubilee? He says, I've come to do all these things, and I've come to, desire, to declare that this is the season of God's acceptance. Look at the Bible, hear the Lord's favor. Look at the Bible in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 13. It says, in this year of Jubilee, everyone returns their own property. Uh, look at it in um, the Numbers. It says that you blow the ram's horn, a year dedicated to rest, restoration of property, free people from debts, servitude, slavery. Therefore, Israelites would dedicate this year the rest to God. He knows that God would provide for their needs. Now, let me tell you what this simply means. Ready? Jesus, there was a year of jubilee in the Jewish culture that God declared that every 49th year, in the 50th year, all debts were canceled. Isn't that great? I'd like that. All debts were canceled. If you had, if you had, if you served with some, if you served somebody because you're trying to pay off a debt, in the year of jubilee, whatever year it ran into, if it was 2021, you, you would only have a few months left and you would totally be wiped free. Everything's clear. No more debt. You don't have to serve them anymore. You are free forever. Think about it for a minute. You, you, you could have a debt. Can you imagine some of the debts we have? You could have a debt. Imagine if it was, I'm just using an example. Imagine if you had a debt on your house and, and there was, and you, you, you owed $100,000 on it. And three months, the year of Jubilee's coming. In three months, a brand new year's coming. And what that, does that mean? That all that debt's canceled. I don't know about you, but I would be having a good time with that, wouldn't you? I'd be thankful. Oh, hallelujah, your jubilee's around the corner. I may have a debt. I may owe some money. I may owe that guy three more horses, and that guy, I got to give him two. I owe him three camels, and I owe this guy, you know, two bushels of grain. And I know I got it. But guess what? Your jubilee's canceled. No more debt. God set that in place so that when the Messiah came, that when the Messiah came, he would declare the acceptable year of the Lord, which means not just your physical debts are canceled, your sin debts been canceled. That Jesus shows up and says, I am here, I am the one who would not only preach deliverance, I would have hearts that are broken can be healed, those that are crushed can be restored, I will bring deliverance to those who are bound. Think about it for a minute. Think, think about it. In our day, do we not need Jesus? Think about it. We need him so much. Preach the gospel to the poor. I mean, not just physically poor, but poor in spirit. Poor in, poor in decision making. You, you ever been around people and, and you realize that the issue was that the decision making was poor? 
And it wasn't because they weren't smart. It's just because they didn't have the wisdom of God. Have you ever made decisions and you look back later and say, I shouldn't have done that? Or, or maybe how much in our day do we need the hearts of people whose hearts have been broken to be healed? Disappointed by life. Disappointed in family. Disappointed about where they are in life. I, I read a book several years ago called Halftime. And, and it's basically a book about you, you get a point in your life. You've lived the first part of your life. You're going in the second chapter. Now it's halftime. You look back. Now you've got to look forward. What's these next years going to be like? And your heart may break. And you may go, man, what did I do? And, and God is saying, I'm going to heal that brokenness. Or maybe those that are bound in sin, those that are bound in, in drugs, those that are bound in addiction, those that, that are bound by, man, they're just captive to anything. I mean, anything can be addictive, guys, anything. You can be addicted to shopping. You can be, a, you, if you're not careful, you can get bound into drugs before you know it. I was talking to somebody just the other day. Jay uh, Turner was in the meeting. And I said, you know, we say what we will. We're all, we can all be about two decisions away of all, all of us being homeless. You know that, right? You, you, there's about two decisions away that you, you could actually be homeless yourself. Think about it. And the idea that, that, that people get bound in all kind of things and people go off the rails and all kind of things. We need Jesus. He recovers sight to the blind. I know people that are blind that need to be physically healed, but also spiritually blind need to be. And the liberty of them that are bruised. Who are bruised people? Freedom. Liberty means freedom to people that are bruised. A bruise is when you're wounded on the inside. A, a, a cut, you can see. You get stitches. But, but a bruise is something that you don't see an outward uh, blood, but what you see is inside something that's broken. And he heals the inside. And Jesus says, the good news is, I also, above all of that, declare that God has forgiven sin and he will forgive you of anything you've done. Now, why is this important? This is important because Luke's desire, his emphasis in all of this gospel is that Jesus is the Son of God Jesus is the Messiah. He cares for those that are outcast. And he's concerned about people being saved by knowing Jesus Christ. And so I, I come, come to this part of this in introduction, and, and I say this to you, that when we read the Gospel of Luke, and as we go through the Gospel of Luke, I want you to notice some keys in the Gospel of Luke. Number one, I want you to notice how many times it says Jesus had compassion. How many times it says Jesus had compassion, like love, was, was moved, okay? Think about how many times when you read the Gospel of Luke, and when you do this study, as you go through this personal study every single day, and you do your personal devotional time, maybe three, uh, fill out three uh, blanks a day. That's not that difficult. But you fill out three blanks a day and answer these questions. Notice how many times you notice that th there's a sense of Jesus not only say it was the speaks of compassion, love being moved, or uh, looking out for those that are hurting. I put that under there. Think about how many times you'll see that in the Gospel of Luke. I also want you to notice in, in how many times in the Gospel of Luke you'll see great power. You will see great power. Jesus walks in such power. Um, I want to say it's the Gospel of Luke. I know it's in Matthew. I think it's in the Gospel of Luke. John the Baptist is in prison. He's discouraged. By the way, John the Baptist was a man on fire, right? We agree with that. If you read the Bible, he was a man on fire. He was bold. He told, you know, brood of vipers. He, 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 he wouldn't play his game. He was out in the country, and they would go out to where he was to get baptized. But he was in prison. He was discouraged. And he sent his own disciples. Find out if Jesus is the one that we were waiting on, or maybe we should look for somebody else. He's discouraged. What does the Bible say? Jesus looks at his, his followers and tells, tells them, look, the blind see, the deaf hear, the poor have the gospel preached, blessed of him that's not offended in me. They leave there and go back to John and tell John that. What, they're to, what Jesus is saying is, John, you were right. You didn't miss it. The Messiah is going to heal those that are broken. The Messiah is going to preach the good news to the poor. The Messiah, when he shows up, is going to have uh, those that, that are blind, those that are deaf, are going to be healed. So don't worry. You, made, you did the right thing, John. Power. You'll see such power 
And I, 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 love, I love this because um, what, what I love about this is I love that, that because, don't, don't worry about that red thing. I love that because what you see in that power is you will see the power of the Holy Spirit involved. You will see John, Luke will continually talk about the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He will talk about the Holy Spirit uh, anointing Jesus. He will talk about the Holy Spirit uh, working through Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to be called uh, the power of God, the finger of God. The Holy Spirit is going to be talked about. And then Luke writes his second part in the book of Acts. It is all about the activity of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. So understand that when you read this gospel and when we study this gospel, notice how many times that you hear about compassion or love or even being moved, helping the hurting. Notice how many times that you will hear about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And notice that when you do that, also notice how many times you, what you will see in this when it comes to Jesus being focused on his mission. He is focused on his mission. He has the mission of heaven. He is going to be focused on his mission. It's in the Gospel of Luke where you find Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. It's in the Gospel of Luke. He will have his face set on going to the cross. So I want you, as you study this Gospel, and as you study the Gospel of Luke, the key verses I want you to remember, he came to seek and save the lost. Secondly, he's anointed by the Spirit. He is the Savior. and He is the Messiah. He is the one that the world has been looking for. And so when you read this, and when you study this, and when we walk through this, my encouragement to you as you walk through the Gospels, as you walk through this Gospel in these next uh, 24 days or 24 chapters, that as you walk through that, you walk through it slowly, you walk through it uh, on purpose, but I promise you, you will grow in this setting. You, you will grow, because that's God's desire is for you to grow in truth. Let me say, let me just really wrap this up because I'm wrapping this introductory part up um, and get ready for next week. Let, let me just say a few things about your study and what I'm expecting of you, okay? Here's what I'm expecting of you. Number one, I'm expecting you to be these, uh, the, these groups every week. Just come to these groups every week. They will last, um, I would say, 25 to 45 minutes. They'll be 25 to 45 minute long groups. Okay, you, meaning you come in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically uh, break down a story in the Gospel of Luke that you've been reading this week. So what's going to happen is you're going to study, and out of all the things you're studying, I'll come back to that in a minute, I will break down one of the chapters, like chapter 5 for next week, I'll talk about what happens with Jesus and Peter and, and the fishing. Okay, um, So come to groups every week. Secondly, I will encourage you to do your, your day-to-day study and it's just really it's just like anything else i i would uh, what is it 21 days to start a habit it's just routine make it a rhythm of your life every day just do three maybe four fill in the blanks three it's so simple it's so simple it's just so simple you know you you read the you read the scripture and then it says what does it say you because what it does is it slows you down because what you need to do is slow down I heard someone say recently, a guy named Mark Sharona, he's a pastor in Orlando, he said this, the closer I get to Jesus, the slower he makes my pace. The closer I get to Jesus, the slower he makes my pace. I think that's important. So we're going to slow down a little bit. We're going to rush through. You may have your own personal devotional time. You can still do that. But I want you to slow down about three. I said three or four, fill in the blanks a day. Do it consistently. Do it uh, faithfully. And in these groups, you're going to hear an encouragement in that. Now, I know there will come up some questions. And, uh, and my nature is, and I'm, so, I'm not going to apologize for it. This is how God wired me up. Uh, uh, my nature is to preach, so it's hard for me to slow down at my own self when it comes to preaching. But if you have it, pastorjamieg at gmail.com. If you have any questions that come up, and you'll, I'll keep putting my stuff up here. Actually, I'll have it featured in the next, uh, next week. If you have any questions that I can bring up in this gathering, maybe something that I haven't covered that you find in the Bible. Maybe you read something in the Gospel of Luke and you'll be like, well, what, is this, what does this mean? You know, and we didn't cover it. Then you can, we can uh, answer those questions, G at gmail.com. Just send me an email. I will answer anything I can answer. 
Uh, this, this is not just, listen, and I say this in sincerity. This, class, this, this group is not just about getting more knowledge. It's about you growing. It's about you growing. And some of us in this room, it's been a long time, or maybe we've never slowed down and did a on-purpose Bible study. And so this is going to be a slow-down, on-purpose Bible study that you do. And as my dad used to say, you only get out of it what you put into it. And so you can leave in the next three, uh, next few weeks, whenever we're done, right before Thanksgiving, you, you can leave here with such Bible knowledge and strength. Now, one more thing I, I, I will tell you. Uh, fill out um, the... Um, Fill out those booklets, keep them, keep your eye on them, and uh, at the end of these, this session, which will be, again, right before probably November, late October, when we get done with this, this group, then what we're going to do is you're going to turn those in, and I'm going I'm to grade them. All right? I'm going to check them. I'm going to make sure you did them. Now, don't write in there, John, don't, I mean, I'll just make sure you did them. I'm not going to, like, say you wrong but now just don't write your name on everything or write you know John Wayne or whatever just so you fill something out but what I'm going to do is do that and that you did that and we're going to give you a certificate seriously we're going to give you a certificate that you that you went through this gospel of Luke class you achieved this thing and you and you're ready to go by the way this is not the only time I'm going to do this this is the gospel of Luke next time it'll probably be one of the maybe Ephesians or maybe Colossians uh, but there'll be others that we're doing, okay, just like this. But it's just, this is going to be your opportunity to not only grow, but your opportunity also to achieve and uh, go to the next level. I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to, on a Sunday morning, present so many of you guys with these certificates that you completed this uh, study and that you completed it with honors, right? Uh, we, we, honestly, it's, it's worth doing. I can tell you myself, personally, I've done those very studies for other books of the Bible, and it has blessed me. And honestly, for me, and it'll probably be for you too, once you kind of get started, you won't want to stop. Don't try to do all the whole thing tonight, okay? Because a lot of times I'll do that. If I start reading a book and I like it, I won't put it down. If I start doing a study and I like it, I won't put it down. Years ago, there was a, 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 a 13-week class that we were supposed to do of studies, and uh, I started reading it on my own. I didn't do the study. I just got the book and started reading the, the stuff and filling things out. I, I tried it. I did it like in three weeks, the 13-week study. Because I was so excited about what I was reading. There's something about marinating on what God has for you. There's something about soaking in that. You know, what's God teaching me through this? Can I give you a little hint? What I do as a pastor, and, and I, we're almost done, is I, I usually take Wednesdays as a study day. So Wednesday, I am finishing up whatever I'm doing on Wednesdays. If I'm doing online stuff, I finish it up on Wednesdays. I'm working on Sunday morning's message. We're finishing that up. So, so Wednesday's dedicated day, just study, get prepared, get ready, focus, okay? But I start working on my messages usually on Sunday. So about Sunday evening, um, Sunday or now it's Monday a little bit more, but Sunday evening, I will be already thinking about what I'm going to say to you uh, the following Sunday. I'll start it on Sunday night. And what happens is when I get something in my spirit, I will let it stay there and marinate a bit. Right? Let, let it crock pot a bit. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Put it in that crock pot for a while. And here, here's what happens. During the week, things will come up, things I'll read, things that people say, issues that arise in people's lives that, will, that I will identify as that's, that's an opportunity to speak life to that. That's an opportunity to speak to a whole church about stuff. That's an opportunity to, because what happens is I'm already geared up to what I'm thinking about. And as I go through the week, it, things are added to it because I'm seeing, yeah, you're right. It's like this, okay? It's like if you're going to buy a car and you buy a car, right? Whatever car it is, you buy a car. And when you leave that drive, that parking lot, you're driving that car. How many of you, when you buy a car and you taking that thing home in the next week or two, you see your car everywhere because you notice finally everybody else has the same car. Yeah, that guy's got the car. Oh, he's got a Buick too. And, you know, he's got this. Why? Because your eyes have changed, right? You've changed your attention. That's what happens. And so I'm encouraging you, read the Gospel of Luke. My prayer is that as you go through the study, it will change your attention. Things will come up. Kids are asked questions. Grandkids may call you. People you'll run into. Things you'll notice. Jesus said this. Jesus, 
I'm telling you, God can do it. That's how you grow. That's how you grow. So I'm asking you to, to do that, okay? So groups every time, 25 to 45 minute groups. We're not going to, yeah, you know, we got it. We have an hour to do everything. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to max it out. Trust me. Second thing is day to day, do your devotion, do your time, slow down. If you have questions, email me, but fill this thing out. And at the end of this class and at the end of this group, we'll encourage you in this Bible study. We'll give you a certificate to tell people you completed this and uh, you'll have that. Okay, there we go. All right, good stuff. This is just introduction. Next week, I'm going to talk about Jesus doing the miracle of the, of the, the fishes. And I'm not talking about feeding the 5,000. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the fish when Peter didn't want to throw out his net. What all happened there? It's powerful. It's an encounter with God. Peter had a supernatural encounter with God in that. I'm going to talk about that one next week. All right, would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for teaching the Word. Thank you for this introduction, Lord. These, these 40 minutes of, of talk and 40 minutes of introduction. We pray for something greater to happen. We pray for growth. We pray for spiritual growth, growth in knowledge, growth in your Word. But more than anything else, God, grow, being closer to you, growing closer to you through this process. Thank you that you are the one who delivers those that are bound. You are the one who brings life. You are the one who, who is anointed to bring deliverance to those, God, that are brokenhearted. God, we want to praise you. And even now, heal every broken heart. Heal every uh, wounded spirit. God, those who feel like they're bound by guilt, I pray let them know that this is the time of God's favor, not his judgment. This is a time of God's goodness, not his wrath because of the cross of Jesus. We praise you for that in Jesus' name.